So on behalf of Temple Sinai Social Action Committee and the Pachamama Alliance, uh, we are absolutely delighted to have all of you here to walk this journey with us today. And we are all on a journey about our democracy. Uh, before I go farther, I want to uh, thank the wonderful teams that have collaborated to put this program together. The, uh, the Temple Sinai Social Action folks, would you just wave your hand, the Temple Sinai Social Action Peace people. Mama Alliance folks who have been working on this for literally months. We've been, we've been uh, working on this and it would not happen without this tremendous, tremendous help. So just uh, very briefly, we always like to recognize that the land we are on was uh, the land of the Haudenosaunee who contributed so much to our thoughts about democracy before they lost their land and and their culture. So just a moment to appreciate that. The Pachamama Alliance is an organization that's devoted to bringing a human presence on the planet that's spiritual, that, that's uh, environmentally sustainable, socially just, and spiritually fulfilling. And that, of course, fits so much with the Temple Sinai social action uh, desire to do, to, to kun alone, to make things right in the world. So um, the Jews, uh, as you may know, are right. The Jews are in the middle of the days of awe, the high holidays uh, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And during that time, we are asked to pay attention deeply to where we have missed the mark, given this magnificent creation that we've been given and the imperative for justice and compassion. And so it seems as if this program fits right into that. And because when we do our, our atoning, it's not only for what we have done, but for what others around us and the whole community has done. And so we, we take responsibility uh, for all of it. So just a few... Um, Housekeeping. The bathrooms are down that hall. If you continue from where you came in the front door, the women's room keep going down the front hall, past the first left, and you'll see it on the left. The men's room is, you would make that first left. And then we have a uh, handicapped, non-gender, uh, all-gender bathroom that after you make the first, uh, first left, it's right there. I think you'll see it. Um, I think the, oh, the exits, there's uh, the exit that you came in, there's an exit right over there in the back of the hall, and there's another one across, if you go out this door, the, right across that hallway is yet uh, another exit, uh, should you for any reason need it. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today. Uh, Dr. Joan Rubin, who calls herself Joni. <laughs> so uh, she is a member of Temple Sinai. She is the Dexter Perkins Professor of History and the Ani and Mark Abrellian Director of the Humanities Center. It's a new, very exciting Humanities Center at the University of Rochester. She grew up in Rochester and has an A.B. from Harvard University and a Ph.D. from Yale in, in American Studies. She's the author of four books and numerous studies, numerous articles. She specializes in American cultural and intellectual history. She credits her parents, Pearl and Sidney Rubin, who both my husband Bob and I were uh, privileged to know, uh, with instilling in her a commitment to justice, democracy, civility, and social action. So I'm going to turn it over to Joni. How about this? Yes. Okay, great. 
So, welcome everyone. I uh, was a little disheartened when the weather turned so nice because I thought we might lose our audience uh, and it's great that you made the choice to join us today. Our program itself is a sign of the enduring strength of our democracy. It evokes the tradition of the town meeting where people spoke their minds, and I want to assure everyone that we, this afternoon, will be open to your speaking your minds, how, whatever your views may be. Yet, we are all aware that threats to our democratic practices, to our constitution itself, exist today. We are here to gain some historical perspective on those threats, to consider the state of our democracy in light of the work of our best social scientists, to interrogate the information we are about to acquire, and then to consider together as a community how to go forward and take action. I am grateful both to the Pachamama Alliance and to the Temple Sinai Social Action Committee for making this opportunity for us to work together possible. So we're going to start with uh, what on my um, instructions uh, it is called the professor's presentations. <laughs> and, and we are professors, but we are also citizens, and uh, we will be talking in that spirit. I, our first presenter will be Michael Brown. Michael Brown has a PhD in history from the University of Rochester, that is from my own department. So I knew him when he was a graduate student, when he was our stellar graduate student. <laughs> and, and I'm very proud to say that in this terrible job market, he was able to land a position as assistant professor uh, at, of history at RIT. And this was especially important to him because he is from Rochester, as I am. Mm -hmm. This Joyce is. Uh, in uh, August of 2020, his book, Experts, Eggheads, and Elites Debating the Role of Intellectuals in American Politics, 1952 to 2008, will be published by the University of Chicago Press. Michael has been a member of the Board of Contributors at the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle and a contributor to Dissent and Philosophy Now. He is the chair of the 23rd Legislative District Democratic Committee and the organizer of Flower City Philosophy. This is wonderful. Flower City Philosophy, which meets every Wednesday at local pubs. <laughs> so you can get more information about how to join that group from my oh, Yeah. So uh, I'm going to turn things over to Michael, pass him the mic, and then the rest of us are going to sit here so we can look at his PowerPoint. Michael Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. You're all welcome to attend Flower City Philosophy, by the way. 7.30 at the Old Toad on some Wednesdays, 7.30 at Chocolate and Vines on other Wednesdays. There's no uh, reading assignments, so you can come as you are and participate fully. I uh, was informed that there's a parking space that bears the insignia Mets fans only. And I felt right at home there. And it put me in mind of how the only way that I'm able to distract myself from the pain I feel at the current political moment is to dive into the even more deep form of suffering that is being asked. <laughs> and apparently the rabbi here shares that kind of existential experience that I also partake in as a Mets fan. <laughs> Let me thank Joyce Herman and the uh, Pachamama Alliance for sponsoring this event, and to the congregation of Temple Sinai for hosting it. Um, I hope that the members of the congregation have so far um, had a good period of the high holidays and that that continues for the members of the congregation. We congregate today on the basis of shared anxiety about the future of American democracy 
and our desire to do something about it. What is the meaning of the democracy we wish to defend? The Trump presidency has violated the tenets of democracy as a set of institutions, norms, and procedures often gathered under the heading, the rule of law. If democracy is the rule of law rather than the fiat of a dictator, and by that I mean the willful acts of a dictator, not the small but well-built Italian automobile of a dictator. <laughs> if democracy is the rule of law rather than the fiat of a dictator, then a lawless and capricious chief executive is indeed a serious threat to democracy. At other moments, however, we speak about democracy as meaning the rule of the people. Democracy as a system in which the will of the people is the supreme power in the land. This second definition of democracy may seem reasonable, even morally laudable, but it sets up a serious problem for the first definition. Democracy is a set of institutions, procedures, and norms that make for the rule of law. What if these institutions, procedures, and norms, rather than embodying the people's will, are seen as frustrating it? Worse yet, what if these institutions, procedures, and norms, even the law itself, have been captured and controlled by an elite, acting not on behalf of the people, but purportedly on behalf of their own narrow interests. What if these institutions were in fact created for that very purpose? The perpetuation of elite power, the promulgation of an establishment, rather than the expression of popular will. In that scenario, or when enough people have been convinced, sometimes by propaganda, that such a scenario obtains, then democracy in the first sense, a particular set of institutions and norms, may be ridden roughshod over by democracy in the second sense, the will of the people. A will as embodied, perhaps, by a populist leader who proclaims that his violation of procedures, denigration of institutions, and flouting of norms is motivated not by a desire to violate democracy, but by an urgent need to save it. This, I think, is an argument that those of us interested in preserving democracy need to understand. It is also one I think we need to be prepared to rebut. For rarely does tyranny appear in its own garments. It often arrives wearing the cloak of the people. Challenging the idea promulgated by right-wing media and subscribed to by his supporters that Donald Trump is a champion of the popular will, and thereby a boon for democracy, rather than a serious threat to it, may be more difficult than it seems to those of us who recognize what a dangerous leader he is. And that is because the Trump strain in American political culture runs deep. Allow me to illustrate that point with an utterly outrageous juxtaposition. Consider radicals, resistance, and revenge, the left's plot to remake America by Judge Jeanine Pirro, currently on display just inside the entrance of the Pittsburgh Barnes and Noble, in comparison to some strictures upon the sacred story recorded in the Book of Esther, a sermon delivered in 1775 by Oliver Noble, pastor of a church in Newbury, Massachusetts. 
Speaking weeks before the battles of Lexington and Concord, Pastor Noble, fanning the flames of the American Revolution, found in the ministers and courtiers of King George III of Great Britain a conniving cabal to rival that of the devious Haman at the court of Ahasuerus in the Book of Esther. While Haman plotted to wipe out Esther and her people, plotters in the British court were conspiring to wipe out the liberty of British subjects. Can it be any longer a secret, Pastor Noble wrote, that a plan has been systematically laid and pursued by the British ministry for enslaving America as the stirrup by which they design to mount the red horse of tyranny and despotism at home. The British government, he said, was filled with designing Hamans and their creatures who want to take our estates, if not our lives, for a prey, that they may riot upon the spoils. And prompted by the stimulus, they have used every artifice to blind the nation that they might aggrandize themselves at the expense of the nation and by the ruin of America. The year was 1775, and the rights and freedoms of the American people were in danger from a deep state of government officials who were plotting to overthrow self-government and institute tyranny all for the sake of their own gain. In Judge Pirro's book, the year is 2019, and the White House stands alone like an ancient walled city with barbarians storming the gates, looking to annihilate the man the American people put in that house in 2016. He was the outsider, beholden to no one, who promised to take back their government from the corrupt special interests who had stolen it from them in order to remake America into a borderless, multicultural, socialist wasteland that they could then plunder and leave to rot. That corrupt establishment, the swamp as President Trump and his supporters call it, was not going to give up the Oval Office without a fight. They were determined to maintain their power regardless of any election results, regardless of the consent of the governed. They were not satisfied to fight honestly at the polls. If the people voted for change, they were going to nullify those results with phony investigations, all-out suppression of dissent, insurrection at our borders, and even violent resistance. Their goal was to destroy the administration of the duly elected 45th president by any means possible. Once again, a cabal within the government is working to overturn the will of the people and to ruin America for their own gain. In 1775, Pastor Noble warned the American people of a plan systematically laid and pursued by the British ministry for enslaving America. In 2019, Judge Jeanine warned them of the left's plot to remake America into a socialist wasteland. <coughs> Luckily for Esther, Pastor Noble pointed out, a merciful God heard the cries of the suppressed people and laughed at the haughtiness and held in derision the plot of the man, Haman, that exalted himself against God and conspired the destruction of his people. God would similarly aid the American people against those plotting their enslavement. Pastor Noble firmly believed that the God who turned the slander and falsehood of wicked Haman and his accomplices upon their own heads would speedily appear for us and plead our righteous cause against all those that have so falsely accused us, so unjustly reproached us, and sought to enslave us. Pastor Noble was sure that God would redeem the people's freedom and frustrate the people's enemies. 244 years later, 
Janine Pirro also placed her faith in a supernatural sounding being who would crush the deep state conspiracy and make all things right. <coughs> Donald Trump is a non-stop, never give up, no holds barred, human version of the speed of light, she wrote. Even his terrific staff, many half his age, can barely keep up. Luckily for us, the Trump presidency has changed just about everything in record time. And thank God, it has. <coughs> when the system has become corrupt, when the institutions have been captured by nefarious elites, only an exogenous shock, a rogue outsider who refuses to submit to procedural constraints and niceties, can drive the establishment from the seat of power and thereby restore the people's will. Returning to the distinction between procedural and popular democracy by way of Esther, the American Revolution, and Judge Janine, we see instances where, when these two conceptions of democracy are seen as conflicting, the latter claims the higher ground. Many of us here today may be concerned by what we see happening with the Trump presidency. Because we believe that procedural democracy enables popular democracy. We think that laws, procedures, and institutions are in place to protect people and express their will, albeit imperfectly, and with a need for constant vigilance and revision. Such revisions and reforms are made when procedural democracy channels political conflict in nonviolent ways, moving over time toward a more perfect union. Critics on the left and the right have, throughout American history, found that belief to be naive. For these critics, <laughs> procedures and institutions don't enable people power, they frustrate it. The left has often pointed to the way economic inequalities become political inequalities. Concentrations of wealth lead to concentrations of power that serve to perpetuate inequality and blunt challenges to it. This 1889 cartoon in Puck, entitled The Bosses of the Senate, shows money bags representing corporate interests lording over the legislative chamber. While the entrance for monopolists is wide open, the people's entrance is closed. Elizabeth Warren points to this problem when she says, let's all be clear, government does work. It works really well for those who can hire armies of lobbyists and make big campaign contributions. It's just not working for American families. Government may have been so captured by economic elites and so structured as to serve their interests that no change from within the system, no reliance on the very institutions and norms and procedures that have been captured will work. That's why we often hear the language not of incremental change, not of procedural change, but rather of political revolution, as Bernie Sanders has put it. That the context for this rhetoric is a major party presidential primary, however, ultimately suggests a pretty robust commitment to procedural democracy on the part of sitting United States Senators, alongside calls for renewing and reviving popular democracy. I am personally generally sympathetic to these kinds of demands for change, to these kinds of calls for popular democracy. What distinguishes them from claims made by Trump and Trump supporters that he represents the people <clears throat> against the deep state and its corrupted institutions. Well, 
When voices in our politics claim to vindicate the will of the people, who are the people they have in mind? Tom Watson of Georgia was a leader in the People's or Populist Party of the 1890s. And he opposed what was then called the money power on behalf of ordinary farmers or people power. In 1892, he reminded black and white laborers, you are kept apart that you may be separately fleeced of your earnings. You are made to hate each other because upon that hatred is rested the keystone of the arch of financial despotism, which enslaves you both. Unfortunately, Watson's career came to exhibit populism in its racist form. For he turned sour after a string of political defeats, and was by 1913 calling mob violence in the form of lynching a good thing. For it showed that a sense of justice yet lives among the people. By the people, Watson clearly meant only white people. The prospect of a multiracial alliance founded on economic grievance had vanished. When the people are defined in racial or ethno-nationalist terms, religious terms, they may be a people led by those who, in economic terms, properly belong to the oppressive class. Hence the seeming contradiction of Andrew Jackson, owner of a 1,000-acre plantation worked by 150 enslaved people, Jackson becoming a symbol of and hero to the so-called common man. Or Donald Trump, New York real estate mogul, purported to be fabulously wealthy as a champion of the forgotten man that Trump invokes Jackson as a precedent, explains something about the kind of popular democracy he has in mind. Andrew Jackson ran roughshod over the Supreme Court, particularly with respect to the Cherokee and what was called at that time Indian removal. And he dramatically expanded the powers of the chief executive. While his admirers celebrated such aggressive, even manly leadership as part of Jacksonian democracy, his, his critics claimed that it was more properly the road to tyranny. Sometimes procedural democracy can act as a check upon popular democracy. Sometimes it can even become captive to special interests. Reformers have struggled throughout American history to address these problems, and they have done so with uneven results. Procedural democracy may limit the will of the people, but it also constrains would-be tyrants. And in moments when tyranny looms, popular democracy, we, the people, defined as all of us, must vigorously defend procedural democracy. For in doing so, we are not just protecting rules and institutions, but ultimately safeguarding ourselves. Thank you very much. Professor Gretchen Helmke, who is Professor of Political Science at the University of Rochester. She received her PhD in that field from the University of Chicago in 2000. Her research focuses on political institutions, democratic consolidation and erosion, the rule of law, and Latin American politics. 
Her most recent book is in that area. It's called Institutions on the Edge, The Origins and Consequences of Institutional Instability in Latin America. Gretchen is one of the founders of Brightline Watch, and we have some information about Brightline Watch on the table. This is a nonpartisan organization that brings together leading political scientists, of which she is one, to monitor democratic practices in the United States from a comparative perspective. And she's going to share some of her knowledge about that subject now. Thank you, Gretchen. much for organizing this choice and Joni and thank you so much for inviting me to be here today and thanks to all of you for coming out on such a beautiful day uh, to talk about such an important subject. Um, so as a political scientist I have spent the last few decades studying the failure of democracy and the rule of law in Latin America. I did a lot of field research when I was in graduate school in Argentina. I've worked in Mexico, I've worked in Ecuador, I've written several books on the subject and articles. And up until 2016, I had regarded American politics as relatively boring, I have to say. I'm sorry to say that to some of the historians in the room. Um, to me, it seemed that checks and balances and the presidential system that we have, while it certainly wasn't perfect, and while there were a lot of problems with uh, vote suppression during the 20th century, a long, it took a long time, obviously, to incorporate women, um, you know, all the things that we know about the problems with American democracy, that relative to other parts of the world, particularly Latin America, American democracy looked pretty good. And I'll show you some data for that in, in just a minute. Uh, starting with the 2016 campaign, however, uh, some of the rhetoric coming out of the Trump administration began alarming many of us who had studied problems or challenges confronting other democracies uh, in, in other parts of the world. Um, and I'm talking here specifically about, uh, and this again was candidate Trump, uh, baseless allegations of voter fraud, a candidate who indicated that he might not accept the outcome if he lost the election, uh, a campaign that routinely winked at, even encouraged violence, and also, of course, a campaign that vowed to lock up its main political opponent. All of these things for people who had studied the collapse of democracy in other parts of the world uh, were, were disturbing and were all too familiar. And, sorry, it's hard to, there we go. So in the days leading up to the election, um, I decided to take some action. Now, political scientists, you may be surprised to learn, are not particularly political. Uh, as the saying goes, we tend to analyze politics, not participate in politics. Um, but uh, right before the election, I decided to write an open letter that flagged some of these concerns that I had. And I did this with colleagues at Yale and at uh, Dartmouth College. And within, what was it, my husband's here, I think within about 36 hours, we had uh, over 350 of the leading political scientists across the country signed this letter. Um, it was published uh, in, uh, in the Washington Post, uh, you can see November 7th, the day before the election. Um, obviously it didn't work. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we were surprised, as everyone was, with the election outcome, but the day after, not the day after, but in the, in the weeks following the election, those same colleagues and I decided to form Brightline Watch. Um, we do have some information about it that you can look at um, after, after the discussion today. Uh, we have data. Um, one of the things we've been doing is we've been periodically polling political scientists um, across the United States. We've also been polling uh, the public, um, working with um, firms like YouGov, 
Um, and we've also been po uh, polling segments of the public, mainly donors, um, and asking them questions about basic commitment to democracy and the performance of the government. We've also been doing um, sort of more academic things like running experiments and conjoint analysis. All of these things are available on our website, including all of the raw data. So uh, for those of you who know smart undergraduates, um, I encourage you to download some of the data and look at some of the results. But we also have everything analyzed in survey reports uh, that we issue periodically. Um, so let me start with the good news first. So this graph uh, is actually from another of my colleagues, Daniel Treisman, who is a professor at UCLA. And this is basically a statistical model using all of the information that we think we know about democratic collapse and mainly coups, looking at uh, the standard model, which looks at things like income level, economic growth, past history of democracy in the country and the history of democratic breakdowns, as well as the level of democracy in neighboring countries. According to all of our standard statistical models that are out there, the chances of US democracy breaking down in the way that we've seen occur in the 20th century in places like Latin America is basically zero. Uh, there's, you know, the idea that there's gonna be a coup tomorrow, that democracy is utterly gonna collapse, according to these models, is, is basically uh, zero. That said, we know that something is going wrong in our democracy. There certainly has been an erosion of the commitment to democratic norms and values, and we can see this in um, a series of polls. So right now what I'm showing you is data from Brightline Watch and also data from uh, VDEM, which is another source of um, extra polling on democracies around the world. If I showed you this graph using Freedom House or Polity, uh, you basically see the same trend. Um, what we have is we have sort of a steady increase um, in the experts' ratings of democracy uh, throughout the 20th century, leveling off under different administrations, Republican and Democratic, and then sharply dipping in, in 2016. So what's going on here? Well, this is based on our data, uh, relatively recently reported by the Congressional Quarterly, that asked experts about what exactly this administration has been doing. And as you can see, it's ordered in terms of importance and how normal or abnormal the behavior of the administration is. And a couple of things really stand out. So on the more abnormal, important side, right, we have calling the press the enemy of the people quite abnormal for an American president. Also retweeting calls to imprison political opponents uh, and claims of the absolute right to pardon himself. Now, these things are certainly atypical. Why do they matter? Well, these are key indicators of authoritarian behavior that were identified by Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt in their recent book, How Democracies Die, which I highly recommend reading. Over here are the four sort of problems or four things that would-be autocrats tend to do. They uh, reject or have a weak commitment to the democratic rules of the game, check. Uh, they deny the legitimacy of political opponents, check. They uh, tolerate or encourage violence. Again, we see that going on in the Trump administration. The recent tweets about civil war are particularly disturbing, I think. And also they show a readiness to curtail civil liberties of opponents, including the media. Uh, and we've seen this repeatedly during the campaign and also in the administration. So let me transition here and talk a little bit um, about some of the other results that we have. Um, but first, I want to kind of put this in a broader political science framework. So one of the key things that we think about is not just how we can get democracy, but how we can make democracy endure, how we can keep democracy going. And the idea is that accountability rests on the ability of citizens to be willing to hold leaders responsible if they violate the rules of the game. 
right? But how does this occur in a context of hyperpolarization? How does the rule of law endure in a context where people can't agree? Right? The key components of this are that citizens must have shared principles and, secondly, that they must have shared perceptions of what's going on in our country. What we are finding consistently with the Bright Line Watch polling, and this is the good news, the public does tend to share a commitment to democracy, at least in principle, and I'll show you that in just a second. That said, the public is deeply divided over whether the current government is meeting or violating the basic principles of democracy. So here is one of the polls that we did, I think from September 2017, but actually we just repeated this in March of 2019, and the results are really consistent. These are um, asking citizens how important these various components of democracy are. So everything from a commitment to free and fair elections, to equal voting rights, uh, to things about transparency and accountability, to different kinds of institutional checks um, on, the, uh, on the president. And what we see is we've broken it down by the um, citizens who approve of Trump and those who disapprove of Trump. What you'll notice, two things, is that um, those who disapprove of Trump rank most of these things as slightly more important, but look at how close they are, right? Statistically, they're basically indistinguishable from each other. They're very, very close. Uh, there are some differences, right? There is on the no foreign influence, for example, we see um, a rather, you know, not a huge gap, but at least they're uh, distinguishable from each other. Now look at, so if they have the same relative commitment, at least abstractly, to the principles of democracy, now look at the performance data. Okay, this is basically how well does this statement describe the US today? And obviously the people who approve of Trump uh, think that the US is meeting these standards, right, on most of the dimensions of democracy, right? The red is much further over the right than the blue marks are. Um, we see huge gaps, I believe this is from 2018, uh, March 28th or April 2018. Um, we see very large gaps in a couple of areas, uh, equal voting rights, legislature can limit the executive, uh, districts not biased, but we see gaps sort of across the board on a number of dimensions. So let me drill down on just one of them that I think is arguably the most important, um, and that's the Constitution limits the executive. So here I want to show you our results across a couple of different waves of our survey. So the data I just showed you were from, I guess, July 2018. We are currently in the field now. Um, I thought we'd have results to share today, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, the thing to notice here is that in September 2017, there was almost no gap in the perceptions, right? Both pro and anti-Trump voters, the majority of them thought that the Constitution could limit the president, right? Four percentage point gap. That gap jumps to 37 percentage points in July 2018. It declined slightly in March 2019, right, that's after the midterm elections. Uh, that is in anticipation of the Mueller report. My guess would be, though I don't know for sure, that the gap is gonna open up again significantly uh, when, we see, um, when we see the results from the polling that's currently in the field. So today what I've tried to do in 15 minutes or less is uh, share with you what I think are some of the biggest challenges today in American politics. Um, the first is that I think it's very clear that we have an executive who has authoritarian aspirations. Um, we've seen that across multiple dimensions of uh, democracy. The Constitution is important for reining this in, but constitutions are really just paper 
if politicians and the people don't believe in them and don't agree about when they're being violated. The fact is that most Americans across both sides still do believe in checks and balances and things like free and fair elections and equality. They believe these things in principle, right? The problem is that they have radically different perceptions of what this administration is doing. So um, I think we've seen this particularly with the question of can the Constitution limit the executive. I think as the impeachment inquiry moves forward, uh, we will see that divide. Um, certainly not close, maybe even open up further. Um, so today I really described the challenges. I thought I'd leave it to the discussion to talk about things that we might think about to help with this. Thank you all very much. Democratic fashion, we are going to have a discussion. We will take your questions to the panelists, um, and also uh, we invite the panelists to talk with each other, but we're, we, we really want to hear from you. Uh, and I will just try to recognize people. I'll try not to um, overlook any corner of the room. Uh, please just raise your hand. and. Um, if we, try to try to project, and uh, we'll repeat the question, uh, uh, perhaps uh, for people in the back. If you, if uh, well, let's see how it goes. We we might do we have a, we don't we can't really pass this mic right because it isn't working. Okay, let's just um, it works. Test. Oh. Test. Richard, do you want to pass the mic? Richard? <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Shall I try to use this? So I'm no, no, I'm not sure. Let me try this one. Does this work? Yes. yes. I'm confused by the graph up there because it seems to me that if Pro-Trump people, 70% of them think the Constitution can limit the executive. That sounds like good news. So maybe what we want to do is change the words pro and anti-Trump up there. So, sorry, maybe I wasn't clear. It's, it's that is the Constitution limiting the president. So 70% of Trump voters believe that the executive is currently being limited by the Constitution. In a way that they are unhappy with? No, in a way that they are, they are basically saying that the president is following the rule of law. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. We'll make our way to you. My question is sort of a chicken and egg thing. Um, is are the current concerns about democracy and our political leadership, um, did they emerge with Trump, or as Jane Mayer suggests, have been a long standing right wing uh, program uh, and that Trump is just the kind of the flowering of of that kind of uh, long term program. Um, well you may remember that um, Steve Bannon had this term for what he was opposing and that was the regulatory state. And there have been calls uh, now for quite some time about an increasingly power, powerful federal government, what Bannon is referring to as the regulatory state, that needs to be 
opposed and checked in the name of democracy. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, there was a belief among some sociologists, but it became popularized on the right through the activities of Irving Kristol, uh, the so-called godfather of neoconservatism, that something called a new class of experts and uh, government bureaucrats was effectively running the country in a, in a way that was impervious to popular control. And this was the time of the so-called Nader's Raiders and the Naderites. And the belief was that the nascent environmental movement, the consumer safety movement, the regulatory apparatus that these movements were hoping to install within the federal government, all of these were evidence of a out of control overweening federal power that could not, was not accountable to the public. And so the notion of a, a conspiratorial new class with a rogues gallery that at that time included Ralph Nader uh, has been with us for some time. And it's no coincidence, I think, that this uh, narrative about how society works is rhetorically useful for the purposes of an election. Because from a perspective of someone on the left, it allows those corporate interests uh, against which Nader and environmentalists were arrayed to claim not to be speaking in the narrow interests of their bottom line, but on behalf of the popular will against the capture of the people's institutions by an unaccountable establishment of bureaucrats and so forth, who in addition to making rules for you, look down their noses at you culturally. And that's an explosive and powerful appeal during an election. So I'm, I'm going to answer the question, too. I think it's a really important question. And one of the books that I cited up there, The How Democracies Die, has a really sophisticated and rich discussion of this. The answer is not this did not begin with Donald Trump. Right. The book uh, in particular cites Gingrich and looking at the dramatic change in the right uh, with, at least rhetorically, with labeling, uh, basically issuing talking points, labeling uh, the political opponents as enemies, right? As soon as you start seeing language that doesn't just describe your opponents as legitimate, um, legitimate politicians who happen to have a different policy from you, but as traitors and enemy of the state, you know that you've entered a new territory. And that's been going along, on certainly well before Trump took office. That said, I think Trump has accelerated this trend in several important ways, certainly rhetorically. Have quite a bit uh, in common uh, in that they are extraordinary citizens here in our community, like everyone who's out here on a Sunday. Uh, that to me is the most immediate and best evidence for the um, enduring power of American democracy as embodied by people like Joyce Herman and Herman Vogelstein. And to connect that idea to Herman's question, um, historians are sometimes um, promulgating the arguments and sometimes called out to rebut the argument that we've seen this all before so it can't be that bad. And with respect to partisan media, we're often told Look, in the, the advent of the mass circulation newspaper in the 19th century, these were party organs. The Hearst Press was known for yellow journalism. If you think Sean Hannity is bad, look at some of the columns from, from those party organs. And it was widely understood that there was no such thing as journalism as a neutral arbiter of the facts, that all journalism was interested journalism in pushing a certain point of view. And then I even hear, and don't worry, by the way, about rancorous political rhetoric, like um, my uh, political opponent is an enemy who deserves to be locked up, that in the time of Jay's treaty in the early republic, it was said that Jay could cross the country by the light of his burning effigies. And so this is often supposed to make us feel better instead of somehow making us feel worse. What I will say, however, is that um, in the period where people may have been reading this partisan media and consuming this um, journalism that uh, was in no way neutral or attempting to be uh, above the fray, um, they had countervailing experiences of encountering a variety of different people in institutions that are no longer so um, prominent in our society, such as labor unions. Uh, n residential neighborhoods, uh, civic organizations, and so forth. 
So I think it's different if you're consuming partisan media and then encountering a variety of people with whom you converse about these things than if you're consuming partisan media in the era, as Robert Putnam declared now decades ago, of bowling alone. In other words, I think it's worse to be consuming partisan media when you're bowling alone than it is to be consuming partisan media when you're in a bowling league with a bunch of people who have different points of view. And that, I think, is what makes this a distinctly dangerous period, even though there is this precedent. It's not a precedent, I think, that should comfort us. Uh, my, my question is, uh, if you feel that uh, our democracy is not in, in danger of failing, uh, then what other things need to be done to make sure that the Trump administration and Trump is held accountable to the law and to the Constitution? So I think that's basically going to be the topic of the next part of the program, um, right? <laughs> uh, a after we uh, turn to Joyce, but no, I think it's artificial to split off um, the uh, discussion that we're having from the question of what we can do. So let's let these things bleed into one another. At some point, we will um, turn to Joyce for her counsel and then continue the conversation about action. So what? Let me go back to our, our panelists and also, you, you know, you in the audience may, and I hope do, have suggestions for what we can do. Uh, and, and so we'll turn to you as well. But Gretchen, do you want to take this? Sure. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of the things that we can do as citizens. I think one thing that is really important is to educate ourselves about how exactly our institutions of democracy work and what things in the Constitution uh, are helping um, our democracy and helping limit the executive and what things in our Constitution may be distorting democracy, right? So there are certain things like the Electoral College, uh, which is a very um, old institution, and it's an institution that gives disproportionate uh, power to basically people living in smaller states, right? So it's an institution that doesn't make everyone's vote count equally. Um, there are things within the Constitution that certain candidates, like Pete Buttigieg, uh, who has um, some interesting proposals about doing away with the Electoral College, uh, reforming the Supreme Court, I think we need to look at specific institutions of government and think about how we may be able to make them more inclusive and more responsive to people. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it there and talk more about it as we the re response I have is somewhat abstract, uh, and it's that we must not regard um, American politics as a spectator sport. Um, when the impeachment inquiry began, I was greatly exercised by this and reached out to many people that I knew, encouraging them to call elected officials, uh, members of the, the House or of the Senate in either party, to express their support for the investigation and belief that it should proceed. And the response I often got was, well, there's a red wall in the Senate. It'll never happen. I'm not going to do anything. And what I realized was that the red wall was being taken as a given rather than an institution subject to democratic pushback. In other words, the red wall is not a given if enough people tear down that wall, <laughs> to quote them. Ronald Reagan in an odd context. Um, and, and, and so the attitude that um, we have nothing here to do but to sit back and to watch events unfold is a kind of demoralization that will render uh, itself a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it may be that our individual efficacy is not that great, uh, but um, if we become, if we act as if it is great, I believe it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy in the other direction, and it will become great. Mm -hmm. Look at the blue wall that was supposedly a given for Kennedy Clinton in the northern Midwest, and how that was able to crumble. So the red wall in the Senate is as ontologically uh, unassailable as the blue wall in the Midwest. I was quite delighted this morning in my inbox to get the 
latest uh, iteration of a column by Marie Popova called Brain Pickings. I don't know if you're familiar with it, and if you aren't, I highly recommend it. And unfortunately, it came too late for me to get it, to be able to condense it and, and distribute it to you. I would have loved to. But I think there are things, she was quoting a, a lot of Václav Havel who for many of us was quite a, an icon of what democracy can be. And, um, and what, one of the things he said, and this is I think in response to what you're saying, Michael, is that no one can govern in a vacuum. The exercise of power is determined by thousands of interactions between the world of the powerful and that of the powerless. And all the more so because these worlds are never divided by a sharp line. Everyone has a small part of himself in both. And, uh, and later, a, a part of the quote is, history is not something that takes place elsewhere. It takes place here. We all contribute to making it. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Michael Brown. Um, I actually recently graduated with a political science degree with minor in sociology and women and gender studies, so I'm kind of up on the field, as you would say. Um, I would, though, like to push back at some of the things that you said. Um, you used Elizabeth Warren as an example of someone who wants to use the outside versus institutional um, democracy, I forget the exact word, to create change, when I would argue that that's not true, is she is someone who pushed for and was looked to lead a new institution within the government to watch out for consumers, which was not pushed as an outside organization, but as an inside organization, and that your example almost exclusively of money and power as something that the left is pushing against, I think limits the diversity within the left, specifically the role that women have played within the left, who often are not talking about money as this giant corporation, but as everyday wages, what they're taking home, the second shift, that type of issue, equal pay, all these types of issues. And I think it really, both of you, in a sense, failed to discuss the role of women in democracy, such as, I, you hear a lot about modern amendments, but one that has failed up till now is the Equal Rights Amendment, because women are not a part of the Constitution, which is not new, as many would suggest. It came about in the 20s by the same women leading the suffragist movement. And I would argue that when we failed to pass an amendment that was one paragraph saying that women are equal under the law as well as men, that that should have been a sign that maybe our democracy wasn't as healthy as we thought it was because of national rhetoric that was able to silence it within about two or three states that was led by a woman that many thought was a fringe stay-at-home wife that has now been proven to be part of the elite Republican movement, very wealthy movement, who benefited from her husband staying at home and watching the kids for, for her. And so I was just wondering if you had basically any more comment about if you've studied at all women's role in history and what we've done for democracy because I would like that to be brought up today. Um, the first thing to do is simply to applaud the entirety of your comment. Yeah. Uh, and you as an educated person. And there's nothing that you said with which I would disagree. Um, starting with your point about Elizabeth Warren's role in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, I think what's significant is that um, Warren is an example of someone who, as a Harvard professor and then an appointed federal official in the Obama administration, uh, found the limits of um, an inside form of politics not supported by a kind of outsider language about what was going on inside as the embodiment, not of a professorly approach, but of the will of the people. 
so that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was made vulnerable, I think, to attacks that it was a merely technocratic, expert way of uh, a gimmicky approach to manipulating the economy, rather than the embodiment in a new federal agency of the will of the people not to be defrauded by the large banks as they were mere years before. And so I think what's so compelling about the career of Warren is how she is able to mobilize a language of popular democracy to support the mechanisms of procedural democracy and federal organizations like the Financial Protection Bureau um, as ways of carrying out uh, the will of the people. Um, so I think you have added to this discussion of Warren the second half of that, which did not come forward in my presentation. Your larger point about the role of women um, is one that I would amplify and extend to a variety of marginalized people who have been left out of the definition of the people in American democracy, but have nonetheless believed enough in American democracy to fight and sometimes die uh, to get into it. And that to me is one of the, the highest endorsements of American democracy, is the lengths that people who have been excluded from it have gone to over generations women, people of color, working people, members of the LGBTQ community, uh, to gain access to uh, the full rights of citizenship. And so um, there's inspiration that we can all draw uh, from those histories that you're pointing to, which is why, to Joni's point about assaults on liberal education, assaults on textbooks, professors, and programs where you, for instance, gain the knowledge that you shared with us today, I think are part and parcel of this political moment as well. So I, I really liked your question too, and I think one of the things that it reminds me to talk a little bit about are ways, sort of bright spots in what we've seen in the last couple of years. One thing we really didn't get a chance to talk about is the 2018 midterm elections, right? And the the return of the blue wave, and a lot of that was led by women, right, and, and women candidates. We saw an extraordinary number of women candidates run in that election and win. So a lot of the pushback, right, immediately when Trump took power, there was the um, Women's March on Washington, right, an extraordinary <clears throat> event where, uh, you know, his claims about crowd size were, were pretty much undercut um, by the events of the next day that were, that were led by women. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, there was the uh, annual, by the way, just a couple of weeks ago, there was the annual Susan B. Anthony uh, March, which both my daughter and my husband um, participated in. So if you're looking to celebrate women in Rochester, that is an excellent opportunity. A um, couple of other things I would point to, there's a huge gender gap uh, in support for Trump. One of the things that we have in our data is we often also have it broken out by gender. So you are in a particularly good position to download some of our data and do the analysis. Uh, this is exactly why we make it public. So people who have specific questions and ways that they want to see the data presented or suggested to us to do, uh, but one of the things we could very much do with our data and with the opinion is look at how it breaks out by, um, by gender. So thank you very much for flagging that. I think I have found my opening to give a brief commercial, um, and this is for a speaker uh, coming to the University of Rochester Humanities Center on October 17th. I put some leaflets, thanks to my husband printing them off, uh, on the table. This is Masha Gessen. Masha Gessen is a New Yorker staff writer who has uh, written books about Russian Jews and gender issues transgender and LGBTQ issues, and what joins these seemingly diverse topics is her interest in marginalized communities. And we will be hosting her, that's October 17th at 5 p.m., free parking, a great reception afterward, and a chance to meet her, and I urge you to come. I'm gonna take that one urgent question in the back, because that hand's been popping up, and then we're gonna have Joy. I saw Chris Hayes, by the way, and she's one of my favorites. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. And uh, <coughs> Susan Rice was on talking. I'm sorry. Susan Rice is on talking about the whole issue 
of uh, black Americans. And I'm using the word black Americans and not people of color. And black is encompassing of all. We are not going to move forward unless we have a joint conversation with the black community who's been oppressed and the racism that continues in this country. It is a sin. It's a sin to have children in cages. George Takaki was just on television talking about the Japanese internment camps. This information is not being discussed in our schools. Students do not understand the history of racism. I grew up watching the Ku Klux Klan burn crosses. Your voting has always not been suppressed, but a fraud on our community. It's always been, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, by the way, the land of Dixie, Deep South. It is still happening. And unless we have joint, co I come to this because Joyce is here, and we work with, very closely with the community, but we need to have joint, the politicians on television, they're not saying what you're saying in terms of democracy, common conversation to understand what we think. I listen to the conversation I work at Main Street in terms of how the <coughs> black community views democracy. That's critical for us to move forward, and I won't keep you any longer, but thank you. Oh, thank you for your comments. Thank you, and, we, and uh, I, I'm going to, we're going to have a little change of pace, and then we're going to come back to this uh, very uh, uh, energized and uh, important discussion. Uh, but, but Joyce Herman, who uh, organized this panel, and to whom we're all grateful, uh, has a particular expertise uh, and a particular interest this afternoon. She is a member of the core team of the Pachamama Alliance, and she and her husband Bob have been members of Temple Sinai for 51 years. She served on the Board of Trustees here, and she is currently, and has been in the past, on the Social Action Committee. Joyce is a former counselor, and associate professor in the RIT Counseling Center, and she has conducted research about faculty career changers and about mentoring women. Uh, Joyce has served as president, in fact, of the Rochester Women's Network, and she received its W Award, a, a, a great honor. Joyce has also served on and chaired the Commission for Christian Jewish Relations and on the Mo Commission for Jewish Muslim Understanding. So uh, the calls that we've been hearing in the last few minutes about taking into account the views and experiences and feelings of every member of our, our, our community, some of whom uh, have uh, um, uh, experienced disproportionately uh, hate and discrimination and racism, um, those are related to Joyce's own commitments and activities. And so we're going to give her the microphone now for a few minutes. This is the one that works. Yeah. I think I'll stand. It's not working, Joyce. Well, uh, no. it's not. No. Working. No, 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 it was working. Yeah. So, uh, thanks uh, for those important questions. And thanks. How lucky are we to have? Uh, luminaries of this quality. No, you're not going to. Don't press the button. How fortunate yes. we are huh? <laughs> to have uh, people like this in our community with the breadth and depth of uh, information that they have. Uh, and I didn't touch anything. I know. Is this working? No, it isn't. I love technology. Anybody who thinks technology is going to solve our problem, <laughs> this is the answer. I think this one's going to work. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> For a while, anyway. At any rate, I do, I, I think we all can tell how very fortunate we are to have 
the resources that we have at this table. And I especially, I want to thank Joni, whom I got to see. We were at a rally uh, for about the asylum seekers, and we started to talk, and then she said, I'm interested in this topic, and she uh, then suggested that we uh, have Gretchen and Michael on the panel, so I'm so grateful to you. As one of my friends has said, uh, we're certainly up against it right now. And so the question is, what do we do with this information? I mean, this is the barrage of bad news we get every day that comes with us all day long, the sense of threat that we have. Part of what gets to us is the unknown, the uncertainty of the unknown. And it's made worse by a barrage of unexpected that happens uh, daily as well. So at a time of chaos, I'm shifting uh, here. I'm not an expert. And I'm really going to be talking from my own uh, experience. And, um, but in a the, in the time of chaos, what's, which is designed to keep us in a state of fight, flight, or freeze, right? Um, I was thinking that's a lot of F's. <laughs> so how do we get solid footing in the face of that from which we can flow yeah, and think flexibly? That is the challenge. So um, and I want to acknowledge that being threatened and under siege in our democracy is not new to our African-American brothers and sisters, our other brothers and sisters of color, the Muslims in our community, uh, the immigrants, the LGBTQ uh, folks, and it nors it to, to Jews in a, in a whole other way for all the decades. Um, so what I, I, because I've been very privileged and blessed to be exposed to some movements and, and organizations and practices and people, many of you, my beloved buddies, are here today. Um, and I, so I know some of those things. And when I can remember to reach for them, it can be helpful to me in facing what we're facing. Um, and perhaps something that I will offer will, maybe there'll be a nugget that'll be useful for you. So on this rolling ship of state, on these roiling waters, how can we find a steady place to stand? Where can we, an we be anchored? What can we come home to? So it occurred to me the possible answers are in three, three arenas. One is me, myself, this person, Two is me in connection with another, and three is us in community. So I think that there are potential resources in, in each, each of those areas. So the relationship with ourselves, with ourselves, can we remember, can we get anchored in some way? With our breath is one. Would everybody like to sort of take a deep breath at this moment? and let it out. Maybe another. A deep breath. And let it out. In so doing, we can sometimes give us, ourselves, a bit of space. A bit of space. So, um, in a way, when I ask what can, where can we come home to, can we come home to our bodies? And accessing or paying attention to our breath can be part of that. We can also notice, can we be anchored? Our, do you know we are held by the earth? At every moment, we can actually count on being held by the earth. Imagine that, if we pay attention to that. Here we are. We're not floating free in the air. We're being held. So we have our breath, we have the earth. You know, can we be good to our bodies? Can we remember to 
exercise, be in nature, take a warm bath, make a sound. You know, they want us quiet, right? And they want us quiet, and that, that powerlessness that comes out of quiet. So I encourage people to make noise, right? Like, uh, whatever, how you want to make a noise, yeah! Go ahead, join me in a, whatever noise comes to you. Yeah. Yeah. I must say, in some of our Pachamama meetings, we sometimes allow ourselves to do that. We have a great time. It's very, very helpful. And then come home to our minds. Notice our thoughts. Um, you know, those anxious thoughts that colonize our minds sometimes, and we can notice that and maybe have an opportunity to shift. You meditators know you can shift your internal state. When I remember to meditate, I can lower my blood pressure by about 10 points. Um, of course, prayer is another way to, we can direct our attention. At, our, at one of our Rosh Hashanah services, Rabbi Till offered fascinating information based on neuroscience. Now wait, this is, this is really a goodie, I think. If we smile, if we smile, whether we do it spontaneously or on call, we release endodorphins. And those endodorphins can give us a feeling of well-being from which we can decide how we're going to face, you know, the rest of the world. And then, you know, one of the, we can change our fight or flight reaction. And one of the doctors there pointed out after that not only the endorphins are released, oxytocin is released. And that is not so much the internal uh, sense of well-being, but that allows us to, co to be able to connect with others in the community in, a, in, in an engaged and loving way. So I'm going to invite us now, everybody, try a good old smile. <laughs> yeah, actually, smile. Oh boy, that's great for a period. <laughs> oh. Yeah, smile. And notice. Notice. I mean, really. I, I Since Rabbi Till said this, I've been trying to remember this during the day when the news it starts getting bad. Okay. <gasps> smile. It changes the perspective. It doesn't, you know, and the perspective is useful. Okay, what about our external environment? Um, we have to decide to be our own advocates. If we are sitting with being bombarded by angry noises all day long, we are captive to that, whether or not we agree with them. It is doing things to our nervous system. And I think it's, while it's extremely important when we get to the action part, we're going to talk about how important it is, and, and, and I think Michael was trying to, to be well informed, but not every minute, and not over and over again, and not in a way by those that are, you know, raising our, our, our by their tone, raising our blood pressure. So, um, yeah, consider, we, I, we don't watch television, actually. We get the news in other ways, from the radio and the computer, but that's not for everybody. So here's the biggest path to steadiness, I think, that my Pachamama friends have reminded me of, and that is to focus on gratitude. In the midst of all that, as difficult as it is, can we begin with gratitude? How grateful we are, all of us, that you have come here, that you care enough to be here. How grateful to have the support from so many people to make this day happen. How grateful for the sun. How grateful for this beautiful sanctuary. By the way, before you leave, do be sure to just stop in and, and take a look uh, and take a breath in that sanctuary, which is, uh, because it's so filled with nature and spirit, is quite, uh, that'll get some of the endorphins maybe going too. So, 
I, you know, and in Judaism, we're told we're supposed to have blessing and do bless at least a hundred things a day to, in noticing gratitude. So I invite you just at this moment to think of three things for which you are grateful. And realize that you could keep going a long time just, you know, to be alive. So, but there's still the pain and the worry, right? So, notice what our society does to try to take our mind away from the pain and worry. Have a drink, smoke dope, have sex, shop, eat. Have you noticed that food and drink takes up most of the uh, volume of our newspapers and our the magazines and of the advertisements, get out there, drink and eat and forget. You don't have time to be a citizen if you're so involved in that. Numb out, basically. Don't pay attention. Numb out. Joanna Macy, in the work that, re the work that reconnects, speaks of honoring our pain. And that's been part of my path in, in reevaluation counseling is noticing the pain and honoring it. Um, a Japanese, there's a Japanese art that says when a bowl is cracked, what do you do with it? Anybody know? You fill, you know, Pat. You fill in the cracks with gold. And suddenly there's some beautiful object that you wouldn't have known. Years ago, Father Joe Brennan shared a rabbinic, bless him, he would do that, a rabbinic, a rabbinic thought with me in a group, and that was, the only heart that is whole is the heart that is broken, that's been broken. So if we can embrace that pain the brokenness, rather than just escaping it, there's a way that we do get to heal. Um, so that leads me to, to thinking about this I-U place. I said the three arenas. One is I, one is I-U, and one is I-We. So the reality is, while it's important to find comfort and groundedness within ourselves, the reality is from the very beginning of our lives, when we have felt distress, grief, and fear, it usually puts us into an isolated place. We usually, when we're feeling that, we feel isolated. Even though we may be surrounded by loved ones and friends. So I think that, I believe that that loss of connection, early loss of connection and sense of isolation is something we carry with us. Uh, and it's a grief. And the antidote to that is attention. The greatest gift we can give to one another is the gift of our presence. Our presence. And I'm looking out at so many of you there who have offered that gift to me. The gift of your presence non-judgmental, not trying to fix it, not saying my pain's worse than yours, just that gift of taking it in, presence, listening. Eye to eye, soul to soul, healing happens. So we are hungry for this gift. And often when we begin to share from our pain, the listener will chime in with their own pain or try to reassure us, or distract us, or give advice. But it's powerful just to be present, eye to eye, soul to soul. And we can allow ourselves to do it if we know we will get the chance to have that. So I'm going to actually ask us to do a quick experiment here. Some of you have done this before if you've been in my presence. Um, and that is to turn around, or uh, not every other row, turn around, and, and for a moment, 
pair with another person and offer the gift of your presence to that person for one minute, knowing that when I say that minute's up, you will get that gift of the other person's presence for you. So the person, if you find a person that you can pair with, and the person with the longer hair, you can figure that out, start first.